So, today we're talking about interpreting the Old Testament. Last week we looked at interpreting the New Testament. This, of course, is our outline. Next week in the first hour we will deal with applying the principles. And then the second hour will be our final exam. And again, you all have the study notes now, so it won't be any, any concern. You've got all the answers you need. Um, it's like uh, a movie with Alan, Alan Alda. He was an author, and somebody said, hey, how's the new book going? He said, great. I found all the words I need in the dictionary. Now all I have to do is put them in order. <laughs> um, that's sort of like you have all the answers you need. You just have to learn them. So, um, so today we talk about the Old Testament. There's some unique aspects in the Old Testament that we have to be especially aware of, and there is more danger of going off the rails. Um, I don't think that's completely off. Could you turn the fan off? Yeah, Carolyn's not tall enough. The left one, no? Left, left from your point of view. I'm not sure what's off. It's, you never, you never can tell. I think that might have done it. Is it still running? No, it doesn't feel like it. Well, the important part is this is all being videotaped. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, no. okay I think we're good. So many things. Um, so today we're going to look at Old Testament, but in the meantime, you'll remember last week when we talked about interpreting the New Testament, we looked at a number of different genres that exist both in Old and New. I'm going to do a real quick review of that, since that applies to what we're doing today as well. But then we'll talk about some of the genres that are unique to the Old Testament and some of the interpretive issues that are unique to the Old Testament. Um, I've used this slide a lot because our definition for biblical interpretation that we need to keep in mind as we're talking about all this stuff is the process of finding the purpose, meaning, and right application of a passage of scripture through a study of the culture, geographic and historical context of the original writers and audiences, literary genres and forms, and genre is much of what we're talking about here, textual sources and variants, language structure, word meaning and grammar, and theological harmony within scripture. Now, Again, we're talking about biblical interpretation. Two of the words that we've used a lot are uh, hermeneutics and exegesis. Carolyn and I were talking on the trip, and, and she said, okay, what, what again are the differences in exegesis and hermeneutics? The thing to remember is exegesis is what does the text say? So the focus is on the text. Hermeneutics is what does it mean? So when you're talking about having a meaning, and then application of that meaning to your life, that's much more the hermeneutical process. Now those two words, exegesis and hermeneutics, are often used interchangeably, not really accurately, um, but hermeneutics is the larger discipline. It's the, it's the discipline of, of determining meaning uh, in works, especially in scripture. Though you can use hermeneutics in anything. I mean, there's, there's hermeneutics of forestry management, you know, and whatever else you want to think of. So, but exegesis is what does it say accurately, so textual criticism is an exegetical effort. Uh, textual criticism being identifying what the, what is, how can we be sure we have an accurate representation of what the text originally uh, was written as. And then hermeneutics is what does it mean and how do we apply it. So there's where we are today talking about Old Testament. Um, now again, these things, some of these slides I used last week. The Bible contains many genres. A genre is a literary type characterized by a particular style, form, or content. And we have to recognize those discreetly in order to interpret the text properly. As we discussed last week, again, if we try to interpret a, we get a piece of literature, quote unquote, in the mail, and it says, um, final late payment notice. If we interpret that the same way as something we get that says, Mr. Arnold, you might have just won $10 million, then we're going to get ourselves in trouble. Well, the same thing is true in Scripture. If we try to interpret the um, gospel narratives as mythology, which is a genre, um, without thinking that that means that mythology can be true, then we get ourselves in trouble. And so we have to be very clear, what is the genre, what was the intention of the original writer? Okay. Secondly, uh, well, misunderstanding the genre leads to a skewed interpretation. Intentionally mislabeling a genre has sometimes been an underhanded way to deny the text truthfulness. A lot of the 19th, early 20th century liberal scholars would discount scripture by saying, oh, well, it's, you know, this is, a, this is just a mythological story. It doesn't really have any meaning. You can't apply it in any way, literally or you know, significantly. So that's been one of the ways in which people have used, have discounted scripture is by misapplying a genre label. Uh, 
Also, genre interpretation sometimes has been misused to excuse one the demands of scripture. Oh, well, you can't take that literally. You know? Well, some things you can't take literally. When Jesus says, be perfect even as the Father in heaven is perfect, he didn't mean literally you have to be perfect as God is perfect. That's a hyperbolic statement. But when you start trying to say um, that be faithful to your spouse, in the various ways scripture says that, you know, don't commit adultery, well, that's just a figurative expression. As long as you really love someone, it's not adultery. Then you've messed up. You have used a, a genre misinterpretation in order to justify what you want instead of believing that Scripture has some claim on you. All right? And you have to be careful about that. And I quoted Soren Kierkegaard there. Christian scholarship, and this is not to say all Christian scholarship is a bad idea. Kierkegaard wouldn't even say that. But Christian scholarship is the human race's prodigious invention to defend itself against the New Testament, to ensure that no one can con that one can continue to be a Christian without letting the New Testament come too close. Too often that's true in liberal theology. Okay? Now, the largest of the genres of the Old Testament, um, I thought I had a different slide in here first. Hang on. Did I get these out of order? Yes, I did. Um, historical narrative is the biggest genre, or that is the most comprehensive genre, about 60% of the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, is historical narrative. Um, it's often not obvious what the intention was in historical narrative. We have to pay close attention to the context. There often are editorial comments that will say, you know, here's, here's what we're talking about. Here's what we mean. Um, there's often a repetition of words or concepts to help us understand what the emphasis of the biblical authors was, and then often a trustworthy character will appear in narrative as an example of, okay, here's the way it ought to be. Here's what you need to pay attention to. Now, sorry I got these out of order, but uh, let me go back. How do we apply, uh, we have special concerns in interpreting the Old Testament. I just got these out of order, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm missing something. All right. The Old Testament interpretation can be more complex than New Testament interpretation because, very simply, we are further away from it in time. You know, the, the first part of the Old Testament was written 3,400 or so years ago. The, the newest part of the Old Testament was written 2,400 years ago. The Old Testament was written between the traditional viewpoint, which I hold to, is between around 1,400 and 400 eight, uh, B.C., so that thousand year period, the closest of the Old Testament writings to us, which would be Malachi, uh, was written 400 years before Jesus. So we have the distance between us and that writing that uh, creates a difficulty for us. It's also true that when we look at the Old Testament writing, there is less cultural similarity between what we find in the Old Testament and what we, you know, we live in our own lives, particularly we have the concern that uh, the, the New Testament writers were writing primarily in a sort of Greek genre. That's all the New Testament was written in Greek. Greek was the dominant culture, as well as being the dominant language. Well, the fact is that Western culture, our culture, is built upon Greek principles. The idea, I mean, they invented democracy, they invented philosophy, they invented, you know, the whole structure, they invented history. So much of what we understand in Western culture is Greek in its foundation. And so the New Testament is much more similar to us and to our understanding. It's much more natural for us to understand what the New Testament's talking about than it is the Hebrew writing, which was a very different way of thinking. Um, there is some Hebrew influence in the New Testament. Don't misunderstand me. Luke is the only non-Jewish writer of, of any book of the Bible. But all the rest of them are Jewish. There's Jewish influence but still a Jewish influence within a predominantly Greek culture. And so we're, it's easier for us. Old Testament requires that we realize these people lived in a different culture with a different milieu than we have any real sensitivity to. You know, we gotta work at it, in other words. That's why interpretation is critically important there. Uh, next, in terms of special concerns interpreting the Old Testament, we have to, uh, realize what the Old Testament meant to the Old Testament readers. A passage was written by and for particular people at a particular time. And so while we have the cultural difference, we have to do the interpretive task of thinking more about the original recipients. 
particularly the Jewish people, you know, what was their context? Um, and that's more difficult for us than it is to think about New Testament Christian context. We have to identify the basic theological principles or principle reflected in the passage. What is this all about? What, what's the point being made here? Why is this in our Old Testament scripture? Um, and it's very difficult for us to, to get that right sometimes. We all know the Old Testament stories. I mean, if you've been around church at all. If I describe to you this giant man wearing armor, and then he's faced by this boy carrying a sling, what story is that? David and Goliath. Okay, now, what is the theological principle behind David and Goliath? Right, can overpower might. Right can overpower might. Sorry, but no. See, that's what most people think, and that's gotten more little boys' butts kicked by bullies over the years, thinking, if I just stand up to this big guy, I'll be fine. That's not the point. The point is faith in God. That's the point. Sorry. Did, yeah, you, no, no. No, and, and, and it's, it's manifested in terms of right if it's right on the side of God can overcome life. And when you read that story, if you keep in mind that the whole theological principle is that faith in God trumps everything else, you can interpret all the different events in there in light of that theological principle. For instance, when David said, I'll go out and fight the guy, and at first they said, no, 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 you can't do that. He said, I'll go, and, and uh, the king, finally, Saul, finally said, well, okay, you can go. What did Saul then do? Remember? He tried to get him to wear his armor. Now, in light of the theological principle there, how do we understand what Saul was thinking? Well, yes, but Saul was thinking, armor's the answer. Saul was thinking, the might of armor. My armor. Well, particularly my armor. But he was saying, you know, you can't go out there and fight him by yourself. You've got to have some sort of protection, so wear this armor. Saul was thinking in terms of the usual human way is... If you're going up against a bigger guy, you better have better defense. All right? And that's not, it, it, that tells us something about where Saul was, where David was, and how this whole thing plays out. If we understand that the theological principle is that faith in God trumps everything else, and it doesn't require thicker armor, it doesn't require sharper spears, it doesn't require any of that. A small boy and a small stone is sufficient to win the battle. But... Again, if we get that theological principle wrong, then our, we can spin our theology in all sorts of wrong directions. Marvin. Well, and as David said, you know, a lion and a bear attacked the night. I slew one. them, yeah. And, and he's going, this is another lion or bear. This yeah. is the way that I can fight. Yeah. So it, it, that, there's an example that we have to understand the theological principle. Once we come to that understanding, and it's particularly difficult in the Old Testament narratives, then, then we can begin to understand how that applies to all the different elements in that story. Okay. Um, and it's harder to do that in the Old Testament. One of the reasons it's harder to do that in the Old Testament is because we do know the stories. And we probably have experienced whatever the popular interpretation of those stories has been down through whatever our life has been. Um, so many of those stories, you know, uh, we've heard them so many times, and yet, we may very well have gotten it wrong, or somebody have gotten it wrong and given us the wrong impression when it comes to understanding the theological principle. Yes? Is that why, and maybe this is really an off base question, why Armored Christian Soldiers has become a tomb non grata in, in the Christian church? Because um, that exact story, that, that, that feeling that um, we take it literally, uh, as soldiers, you know, with spears and, and guns and things? I don't think that's the reason. I, I think um, I, that, that might be a reason to question that. Now, that's not to say that God has not used armies. No. Uh, sometimes he's even used bad guy armies. You know, he used the Assyrians to, to straighten out the northern kingdom of, of uh, Israel. He used the Babylonians to deal with the, the sin and failing of the southern kingdom of Judah. So God has used armies, and scripture is very clear that he did that on purpose. But um, I think the reason why that song has become unpopular is because a sort of modern milk toast kind of attitude is that, well, you can't, can't be militaristic. Well, sometimes God was militaristic. And if, he's, if he is, 
doesn't mean we ought to, by our own power, again, you, the application of that, it's not that we get you know, bigger tanks and better missiles as Christians and therefore we defeat the bad guys. You know, we are, God will win and we, it, when we are on God's side. But the reason why people have done away with that is because they don't, they don't want that, that song. Um, they do not want an influence on, in our culture that says anger, militance, and violence is sometimes necessary. And in fact, sometimes is part of God's will. God gets angry. Uh, I think I told the story before. There was a, so a beautiful song, which I'm not remembering a particular song right now. The Presbyterian Church, PCUSA, were planning a new hymnal, and they approached the couple that wrote this beautiful song and said, "We want to put it in, put that song in our new hymnal." But the words in the in the song, in one of the verses, said, um, "And on the cross, God's wrath was set aside." And they said, "Oh, we don't want to talk about God's wrath." You know, that, that will warp our children if we talk about God being angry. And so they said, would you change the lyrics? And even though it probably would have been a lot of money in royalties, this couple said, no. Scripture talks about the wrath of God. And so they said, no, we're not going to change that just because you are, there's a political correctness that's motivating you to say that. Just because you're uncomfortable with something doesn't mean it's not true. And so I think Onward Christian Soldiers... That's a politically correct thing, that people don't want to sing it anymore because the whole, you know, they see that militarizing is something. Well, God used armies. In fact, the idea of the church militant and triumphant, that the army of God down through history has been marching, um, that's, that's not only part of Scripture, it's part of Christian tradition that I don't think we should give up. That doesn't mean we, th we should always be thinking in terms of going to war over something, and literally going to war over something. But we are in a battle. So, does that make sense? Yeah. What was that song? Do you remember? I don't remember. But you remember the case. Yeah. yeah. What, what you're talking about reminds me of something that I noticed when I, when I read the, I think the message was the first time I saw it. Um, in, the, in King James, God in the Old Testament is um, God of the heavenly host. Mm -hmm. And in the message, it's the angel armies. Right. And I'm like, armies? What? Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of, but uh, that's what it meant. Exactly. The host meant. is an army. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that. I just thought it meant lots of angels. I didn't think it meant army, but right. apparently that's yeah. what the real translation would be. And like Michael, the archangel, is, is the commander of the military forces of the angel, angelic armies. You know, he is, he is the, that's the reason when you see him slaying Satan, he's always got a spear and a sword and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there's very much that symbolism is not, and I don't care how political correct, politically correct you want to be, you start taking that stuff out, and then you're rewriting the Bible according to your own taste and sensitivities, and we're not allowed to do that. Again, that does not mean that we, we take a militaristic approach to this. You know, we, we don't start arming ourselves. Um, the, somebody said that David Koresh and the Branch Davidians in Waco, that Waco stood for well-armed Christian organization. <laughs> well, we don't want to go there, okay? Um, but Maybe a slingshot and five stones. Slingshot and five stones, we'll go that far. So, Salvation yes, Army comes to mind. Salvation Army, yeah, and you know okay. what, this, you know what the, tag, the slogan, the tagline of Salvation Army is? It's one of my favorite in the whole world. Blood and fire. Oh. That's the tagline of Salvation Army. Wow. Because that's what the faith is about. It's the blood of Jesus Christ and the, you know, the fire of the Holy Spirit. You know, the, descent, the uh, flames is a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the realization that we are at war. The devil is in charge of this world and we are at war against him. And we have to do, we have to organize ourselves. We have to be prepared to stand up to him. Now the Salvation Army, and, and they have, they are an army. They have officers. You know, an ordained person in the Salvation Army is an officer. But, um, and... They recognize that this is a battle. We are involved in a battle, a war. They don't actually carry weapons, but uh, if but they recognize the truth of that. Okay. The army band. The army band. The Salvation <laughs> Army band. Yes. Well, I think I think it was Gideon whose army was first reduced by the way they drank water and then reduced to only a couple hundred men. Right. So that they could win, yep. but know that it was God. Exactly. You know? That it's it's not how many men you got. It's not how well armed they are. It's whether or not. You are, you are doing what I tell you will dictate when you win. But they still fought. Yeah. Okay? They were still prepared to do battle. All right. 
Um, but again, when we're talking about Old Testament stuff, a lot of a lot of people who tend to be more concerned about political correctness than about the truth of Scripture have a lot of trouble with those passages, and they and and they either just sort of jump over them, they disregard them, or else they try to deal with them um, in some way that lessens it. You know, they they deal with them uh, by analogies or uh, allegory. You know, well, what what it really meant isn't that they're you know. That, God has wrath, it simply means he's less than fully satisfied with us. <laughs> um, no, God has wrath. But the difference is his wrath is righteous. His wrath is right and justified, whereas our very seldom is. <clears throat> All right. Then, once we've identified that, that principle, or principle, sometimes plural, we have to decide not only how does it apply throughout that passage, but how does that fit in with the rest of the Bible? Um, Old Testament, as we talked about last week, everything in the Old Testament points, either directly or indirectly, to the fulfillment of God's covenant promises, which means it points to Jesus. We believe that's true. And so we have to look at it in terms of how that is without discounting the first part of this. And that's, that is the second point. We need to focus on how it was received, the original recipients. I've told you several times, I think, that Norman Geisler, who I really like and respect, that he has a book of Old Testament um, uh, hermeneutics. And the difficulty I have is that he has chosen in that book, everything is spoken about in terms only of how it speaks to the coming of Jesus. I, I think that's something we need to do, but I don't think that's the only thing we need to do. Because if we do that, we fail to see how God was working with his own covenant people in the Old Testament, the Jewish people. And we need to be aware of that as well. But then we also do need to think of how it then fits into the rest of the Bible, and determine how we might read the Old Testament passages through the grid of the New Testament, which is the fulfillment. It is the completion. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. And that's exactly how we need to understand our reading of the Old Testament, is that it is fulfilled. It's made complete by Jesus and the message of the New Testament. But it's not done away with. Okay? It's like half of it was, it was there, and that half was intended for the Jewish people, and another half was added. But we need to re we need to have regard for both halves. All right, is that fair? I just looked at this, and I was thinking, seeing things out of order. My apologies for that. But let's talk about narrative from an Old Testament point of view. <coughs> narrative means stories. They are the stories of the Old Testament, like what I just shared with you uh, with regard to. Um, David and Goliath, for instance, any of the Old Testament uh, stories. I'm very sorry. I, I rearranged my notes in the, in the PowerPoint, and I didn't rearrange my paper notes. The narrative or stories, I said it makes up 60, narrative uh, makes up 60% of the whole Bible. Well, half of the Old Testament is narrative, uh, and narrative literally means stories. Narrative is a telling of a story. And so it's a huge deal for us to understand how to read that. But it is, well, I'll talk about dangers in a minute, it is very difficult for us often to get that right in terms of how we read that narrative. Narrative uh, can be seen as having sequential time action, plot, setting, and characters. It is the story form of literature. Jack and the Beanstalk is a narrative, you know, with some moral behind it. In that regard, it's a myth. Well, much of the Old Testament is that. The meaning of the narrative, when we start talking about, well, you know, what does this mean? What are the theological principles? In Old Testament narrative especially, the meaning derives from the action of the characters. What happened to them? How did they respond? Rather than telling us how to live and how not to live, the narrative shows us by the actions of the characters and the consequences. You've got good, good guys, you've got bad guys in the story of Esther. You know, the good guys, Esther and Mordecai. Mordecai honors God, he refuses to bow down and pay honor to somebody who hates God and hates the Jewish people. Um, and how, how do they deal with that? Versus Haman, the horrible guy, who ends up building a huge scaffold outside his house in order to have Mordecai hanged on and ends up being hanged there himself. So what happens to these characters? And what are the consequences of their various uh, actions, activities, attitudes, etc.? So narrative gives us a, really a deeper and clearer kind of understanding, if we read it right, of 
how we're supposed to live our lives, what the real meaning is, than would an essay or some other form. Okay. Old Testament uh, story narrative is much more, though, than history. I talked about historical narrative. When you read the Gospels, when you read the Book of Acts, for instance, those are historical narrative, and much of the Old Testament is historical narrative, too. Particularly Exodus has law, but it's historical narrative about the Exodus of the people. The very name of it talks about a historical event. Um, you get into Joshua and the taking of the land. All of those are historical events. But the Old Testament story narrative is more than just history. It tells us a deeper truth. And in fact, we could call it theological history because it is a story form, a narrative form. But it tells us in those stories, it gives us theology. And by theology, I mean it tells us about God. And it tells us about us. And it tells us about how we and God are supposed to relate rightly to each other or wrongly. And so all of that narrative, all of the meaning that we find in that, all the actions, the characters, and the consequences, all of that gives us a, more, a deeper theological understanding. In that regard, it is historical, it is narrative, and yet it's theological history, not just, you know, not just a story for the fun of a story. Um, now, God uses narrative to teach us, rather, as I said, than essays or some other form, for several reasons. Because it's more interesting, who doesn't love a good story? Right? Yes, most people, you know, do you like reading essays? And people don't usually do that anymore. I do. I love reading essays. Okay? Some of my favorite books are books of essays. But um, most people don't think that way. They would, they would rather hear a good story. When we watch TV, yeah, documentaries are fun sometimes, but the vast majority of what TV people watch are stories. Okay? Mm -hmm. Cop shows or whatever else it is. So it is more interesting. We get drawn into the story, particularly because we can relate to the people involved. Um, it depicts real life that we can relate to the events. I, you know, most of us have not suffered the things that we see in TV shows or whatever. But the idea is the context of that and the people involved we can relate to. Um, it can better portray ambiguities and complexities of life. You get a story and you get these kind of conflicts. A story can present that with us in a way that makes it sink in more than if you said, you know, just sort of stood up here and pontificated about, you know, sometimes choices are difficult, sometimes choices are this, or sometimes that. You tell a story about somebody who's caught in that dilemma and it is much more real to us, all right? Um, it's easier to remember those stories. You know, you know Jack and the Beanstalk. You know, all, you know all of those Old Testament stories. You don't have to hear them very often before you know them. Kids. They can tell you those stories lickety-split, you know. Daniel in the lion's den, okay? We know that stuff because it's easier to remember than trying to remember the points of an essay or other kind of form. And also it can relate these shorter events and incidents to the bigger story, which is the timeline. You will remember earlier in this class I gave you like a 17-point timeline of all of the events. Well, all of these stories fit into some aspect of that and reinforce it and illustrate it and can create for us a greater understanding of those things. So, particularly in Old Testament narrative, we, uh, God uses that to draw us in, to help us remember it, to help us understand how it applies. Now, there are some dangers, however, in Old Testament narrative. The Old, Old Testament narrative is not always clear, especially to Western minds. Remember, we are somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 years away from much of that writing. And so it takes some interpretive work. We have, to, we have to look at it, pull it apart, think about it, and say, what is this saying to us? What, and that's why I said, what's the theological principle or principles? And how does that apply to this story? Because we Western minds often get it wrong, and we may have learned a wrong interpretation of some of these things. And so that's why we need to do the job of interpreting them well. Um, if we don't interpret them well, that didn't change, there we go. Um, it takes interpretive work. Secondly, it is possible for us to lose the real meaning by getting wrapped up in the story. And so we always have to be asking, why are we being told the story? Why is this in here? Why is this in the Bible, not just in Grimm's fairy tales? which, by the way, are really grim. If you go back and read the original Grimm's Fairy Tales, they're talking about warping kids. I don't know how so many, so many children have survived that because they're terrible things, you know, people being boiled alive and beheaded and all kinds of stuff. Um, but why is this story in here for us? 
if we get so wrapped up in the story, and it's great, it's fine for kids to learn the story of Daniel and Lions did and David and Goliath and all those other things, Joshua marching around the city of Jericho. It's fine for them to learn the story, but at some point, we, biblical interpreters, are the ones who need to step back and say, yeah, that's a great story, but what does it mean? Why are we being told this story? What is the theological principle? And then at some point, we need to teach our kids that. I think sometimes we forget that part. And they grow up knowing the stories and not knowing what they mean. All right. Marvin? It's like a lot of children's movies they make nowadays. The children watch the movie and they get one level of understanding. The adults go, and there's a lot more deeper stuff that the adults really enjoy as well. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm interpreting most of these stories now as faith in God. Yeah. This is what happens when people have faith in God. This is how God intervenes in this situation and in that situation. Right. Uh, not about your power, not about your mind. It's, but the story that gets your interest. Right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's probably a good way to interpret all these is to, is to always have in mind the question to ask is, where's God in this? What's the God part? What, what, what of this reflects God and our relationship with him? That's the theological question. Um, it's also possible that we would miss the theological importance of the story. Now, the first part of that, the real meaning, but then the theological importance meaning how do we, what do we learn from it, how do we apply it? These two may sound like the same thing, but the first one, it's possible to lose the real meaning, is sort of the exegesis. You know, what does it say? But then when we start trying to apply it to our lives, that's the hermeneutics part. You know, what are, what are we to learn from this story? Why, you know, why, wh what is it about this that I need to take away and use and keep and teach? All right? Um, and then it is possible to read too much theological importance into an Old Testament story. The tendency for people to, you know, to take any Old Testament reference, any New Testament reference for that matter, and to try to overplay the meaning behind it, uh, to create these things. The human mind, being curious, is always trying to, you know, a lot of the theological writing that occurs today, popular theological writing, is, um, is simply MSU. You know what MSU is? Making stuff up. They take this stuff, and they take a story, and particularly this was true when they would use allegory. And they would take an Old Testament story and they would allegorize it and everything had meaning. And they would build this sort of castle in the air of meaning for this stuff. And, and that's not there. I mean, we need to make sure that while we're looking at what does it say, what does it mean, what's the theological principle, how do we understand that, how do we apply it, don't get so carried away that you're making stuff up. And there is always that danger. This particularly happens with people who are prophetically oriented. This is more true in, in prophecy than narrative. Taking a, a prophecy about you know, the, the moon turning red at the end of times and coming up with that whole blood moon fiasco, you know, that people are cashing out all of their bank accounts and stock because they think that these blood moons that Hagee and others are talking about all the time are going to be the end of the world as we know it. Well, that's reading way too much theological stuff into that. So don't go there. Right? Um, at a certain point, you need to say, is that really in there or not? Because if it's something you really need to focus on, God is not going to hide it from you. It's not going to be that hard to get to. Now, it does require some work. It does require some interpretive work. But you don't have to be a, you know, a novelist to come up with the theological content God desires for us. It, sh it will be in there, all right? Any questions about any of that? We good? All right, let's talk some more about some of the shared genres. And again, we've looked at these last week. Uh, one of these genres that's shared in both Old and New Testament, although we think of it as more of an Old Testament uh, issue, is prophecy. The word prophecy has various meanings, as we discussed last week, but it basically means that its truest meaning, the one that is universally applicable, is that a prophetic word is a message from God. It doesn't mean that it is a telling, the, telling of the future. The difference between forth telling, which means you're telling in advance, versus, uh, I'm sorry, uh, foretelling, which is telling in advance, versus forth telling, which simply means you're giving God's word to the people right now. This is what, you know, thus saith the Lord, this is what he wants you to hear. The majority of prophetic uh, writing in Old and New Testament 
is the forthtelling. It is giving God's message to the people. And so prophets are the people that God has inspired to give the message. When, when the New Testament, when Paul is talking in Corinthians, for instance, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he talks about prophecy being one of the greatest of the gifts, he does not mean telling the future. He means putting out God's, you know, telling forth God's word to the people, which means <coughs> preaching is an act of prophecy. Or should be. Uh, done right. So that's what we mean by prophecy. Context is very important for interpreting prophetic writing. Again, people take these prophetic statements out of context and weave this huge something around them when if they would just pay attention to the biblical context around it and to the rest of Bible of the Bible, it would keep us from doing all of that. All of these people that say, well, the world is going to end on December 20th. He's now an old folks home. Um, the guy a few years ago, whose name I'm missing, remember that big thing about December 20th, the world is going to end? Um, it didn't. <laughs> did, did you notice? This, if they would look at the rest of Scripture, that Jesus was very clear in saying, if you think you know when the Lord is coming back, then you're wrong. Period. Because whatever you think it is, it's not that. Jesus said, I don't even know the day or the hour. Only the Father in heaven. And if you think you know, the only thing I can tell you is it's not going to be when you expect it. And yet people do that kind of thing all the time. It is happening all the time. Just like the, you know, the blood moon people. What's going to happen when that, the moons turn red? Four of them in a row or whatever it is. Um, no. Jesus said, if that's what you think is going to happen, that's not what's going to happen. Well, if they would take it in the whole context, they would not run into those kind of problems. We have to recognize figurative language, including poetry, exaggerated expressions. Those are to be expected in prophecy, because by its nature, prophecy, much of prophecy is written in poetic lines. It's, it's a poetic verse. And so poetry uses exaggerated language and symbolism and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of that is prophetic language. And so when you take prophecy and you try to interpret it too literally, you get yourself in trouble. Much of the, much of the poetry and therefore much of the po uh, prophetic writing is not to be taken too literally or you're going to go in the wrong direction. Conditional and unconditional prophecy we talked about. There is unconditional prophecy which has to do with the nature and unalterable purposes of God. That we take literally. But often, Scripture says, you know, unless you change, this is going to happen. Well, if the people change, that's not going to happen. So that's why it's conditional. We talked about the fact that prophecy has various meanings. Um, the consideration and, implica of, and implications for us today can help you understand what the original intention was. Because these, these things have passed down to us for a reason. And much of the prophetic writing in terms of the, the forthtelling the message for us, not the telling the future. It's, you know, we put our pants, leg on, our pants on one leg at a time, just like the people did in the Old Testament. <laughs> they didn't wear pants, but you get the idea. We, people have not fundamentally changed. We are just the same. And if we read a prophetic message and we, under, and we can clearly see how does that apply to us, then in fundamental ways, it, that's how it would have applied to the people who got it the first time. Now, there would have been cultural differences as well. We have to take that into account. But people fundamentally haven't changed. We're just in a different setting. So once you take that setting into account, the rest of it is still true. Consider the, whether the prophetic predictions were fulfilled or as yet are unfulfilled. Take special note of the apologetic nature of prophetic writing, that the prophetic writing is intended to help us understand the truth of God. You know, fulfilled prophecy is one of the, like Blaise Pascal, that was one of his big points. Pascal said that the number of prophetic statements that we know were written a long time before Jesus, for instance. The book of Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus. The fact that Jesus, everything about him that we can look at, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, etc., 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 that was all written hundreds of years before him, that in itself is evidence of an all-knowing God. And so there is an apologetic aspect to the prophetic writing. Understanding the difference between Old Testament era and New Testament era prophecy. The Old Testament tended to be more symbolic, more poetic. The New Testament prophetic statements tend to be more speeches. You know, Peter and Paul and, and Stephen and others. Those are prophetic statements because they are speaking God's word. But very little of that, by comparison to the Old Testament, is 
sort of mysterious symbolism that we don't quite see how that applies. It's much more applicable, and we need to read those two things differently. Okay? Questions about that? We did talk, too, about the interpreting prophetic writing, the fact that the authors of Scripture understood themselves and their task as occurring in the context of community, so we have to interpret this in light of community. This is not a, you know, whenever somebody says, I am the first person that God has ever given a right interpretation of this prophetic message to, eh, not so much. You know, God works in community. Carolyn, it looks like the camera has pivoted a little bit, has it? We're good, okay. Uh, biblical authors assumed a continuity in God's dealing with his people. God did not, and this is why I have a trouble with the dispensationalist approach. God did not deal with the Old Testament Hebrew people in one way, and then completely shift gears and deals with the New Testament in a different way. Uh, New Testament people. When we interpret the Old Testament, for instance, we have to understand that it may be setting something up that gets fulfilled in the New Testament, but God didn't completely wipe all that away and start all over again. He didn't go, well, that's not working. I'm going to have to try something else. There is a continuity and that's how the biblical authors understood it. The New Testament authors understood themselves as living in the age of eschatological fulfillment. They say in the New Testament that this is a fulfillment of that. That's the reason that the New Testament, there's only two, two of the smaller books, Philemon and 3 John, are the only, I think it is, are the only books in the New Testament that don't quote the Old Testament. That's the extent to which the New Testament writers understood themselves as being in the age and involved in the process of seeing the fulfillment of the Old Testament writings. Okay? And then New Testament believed it was all about Jesus and that he was the fulfillment of everything that came before. We believe that too, although we recognize the fact that we, we need to regard the original message for the original readers. Apocalyptic literature is both in the Old and New Testament. Writings such as Daniel in the Old Testament, Revelation in the New Testament, Apocalyptic means a, re a revealing. That's why it's the book of Revelation. It is the apocalypse of St. John, a revealing of this truth that God has given to him. Characteristically, apocalyptic literature, um, and Revelation is the only real example we have of this in the New Testament. But the Old Testament, we have Daniel. There are some of the other prophets um, we find this in. Clear expectation of God breaking into the present age to initiate a different existence. The use of angelic mediator or mediators. There's always a messenger coming. Uh, to, to share something. The idea of a journey by a chosen human into the heavenly realms. Daniel is elevated to heaven and goes before the throne of the Ancient of Days. John is elevated to heaven and sees, you know, the, and sees what heaven will be like. Symbolic visions or dreams that describe both current and future spiritual realities and divine interventions. And then visions of final divine judgment. Warnings to the faithful of coming distresses and trials. And then encouragement to the faithful to persevere until God intervenes. That's true both in Old Testament speaking to the Hebrew people and New Testament speaking to Christians. All right? Now, law is one of the unique to the Old Testament genres. It is present throughout the New Testament where the prophets, for instance, are declaring you know, a, a legal dictum to the people as to this is what you need to do or this is what you shouldn't do. Uh, but it's especially present in the Pentateuch, the first five books. Starting, um, you know, Genesis has some of that, and, and we, don't, we may not know this, it, but for instance, Noah was given what's called the Noahic Law. In fact, the Jewish people believe that a righteous Gentile is one who follows not the Mosaic Law, because that was just for the Jews, but rather follows the Noahic Law. And if you read about the story of Noah, God gives him particular instructions on how he's supposed to act. And it's bas a basic moral life. And so uh, practicing Jews say that a righteous Gentile is someone who follows the instructions given to Noah because the Mosaic Law was meant only for Jews. All right? Most people don't even know about the Noahic Law. But if you go back and read the story of Noah, you'll pick that up. And so the law occurs in Genesis. It clearly and obviously occurs in Exodus because that's where the Ten Commandments and then the following to that come, come in. It's actually repeated, the Ten Commandments were repeated twice in Exodus. And then the book of Deuteronomy, for instance, literally means the second giving of the law, the second telling of the law, Deutero, second, you know, um, law. It's a, once they'd spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness and all of the adult males from the previous generation had died out before Joshua led them across, except for Joshua Caleb. 
before they had, uh, he led them across into the promised land. They said, we need to go back and review these laws, review the basic instructions. And so Deuteronomy is a second telling of the law. There is, in the Old Testament, a total of 613 mitzvot, to use the Hebrew word, which means commandment. People think of the Big Ten, you know, the Ten Commandments, which are obviously the capstone. But there are 613 total commandments. You all familiar with the book, The Year of Living Biblically? This guy decided, a Jewish man decided he was going to spend one year and he was going to obey every law in the Old Testament. Well, as you can imagine, and he wrote a book about it, The Year of Living Biblically. As you can imagine, it led him into some very strange kind of interactions with people and things like that. Uh, some things he simply couldn't do because legally, you know, you start slaughtering animals on an altar and burning them, then you get in kind of trouble. But to the extent that he legally could get away with it, he tried to do every, all 613, obey all 613 of the mitzvah of the Old Testament. Um, now, those 613 mitzvah, the challenge that we find for ourselves, and this is why interpretation of law, the law genre, is so critical, is we have to determine which ones of those commandments still apply to us. All right? How many of you have had bacon or pork loin in the last week? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, you just broke the law. How do we know that that doesn't apply to us anymore? How do we, you know, if we have a male that's uncircumcised, is that a problem? Is God not going to accept her or, you know, love that male child? Um, all of these different things, um, Leviticus 19.32 says that you, need, you should stand up in the presence of anybody who's elderly. Well, I'm okay, but you guys, I don't know, you know. Um, a woman, according to Deuteronomy 22.5, is not to wear a man's clothing, nor is a man to wear a woman's clothing. Women's clothing. I'm not going to ask. I don't know. That's the Scots out of it. Yeah. The Scots, yeah. Right. What's, when, what, there you go. What constitutes women's clothing? Does it, is a kilt? Um, Leviticus 19.19 19 says you should not wear clothing which is woven from two different kinds of material. If you're wearing any sort of blended fabric right now, you're in violation of that law in Leviticus. Um, but then, so those are all ones you go, well, no, we don't have to do that anymore. Well, how do you decide that? And then you get to, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not you know, bear false witness, which means lie about your neighbor. We go, well, of course you're going to have to follow those. How do we decide? That is a biblical interpretation process. We have to figure out how do we do that. Now, there's at least three ways that we can approach differentiating how we interpret law. One, the traditional approach has been to differentiate, and this is what I usually say, because this is easy to explain, this is what I often have said. The traditional approach differentiates between moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law in the Old Testament with only the moral law still binding. Moral law means what is right and wrong, what is good versus evil, all right? Murdering people is just as bad today as it was when you know, Moses was instructed to write down the Ten Commandments. There's no, not been any change in that moral law. It's still wrong to lie about people. It's still wrong to commit adultery, even though some people would argue with that. Um, the moral law has to do with moral issues. Civil law is laws necessary for the running of a nation. They're governmental laws. And much of the Old Testament stuff has to do with governmental laws. Um, an example of that would be you need, you need to pay taxes to the temple. All right, in order to run the temple, in order to care for uh, people in need that the temple is caring for. Those are civil laws. Well, civil laws, we need to obey, obey the civil laws in our own countries, or our country of residence. But that doesn't mean we have to follow all the laws that were civil laws in the Old Testament, because we're in a different nation, different rules. And so those are no longer binding to us. We, we're, it'd be hard for us to find the temple in order to take our money there. So um, then the third is ceremonial laws. These are laws having to do with the practice of the Jewish faith, sometimes called the priestly laws, having to do with the sacrifice of animals, for instance, um, or that you should wear uh, tassels on the corners of your clothing, and men should have curls, and never cut their beards, and things like that. We see those because they are presented as part of the 
ceremonial recognition, uh, and circumcision for that matter, of being the people of God, then we don't see our, it necessary for us to fulfill those ceremonial laws if we are not Jewish. And we hear Jesus saying, you know, I didn't come to, to do away with the law, but to fulfill them. And so we look at all the ceremonial law and say, like animal sacrifice, Jesus was the sacrifice once for all. And so he fulfills that obligation, and we no longer have to be responsible for slitting animals' throats and pouring the blood all over everything we can see. Which I, I, I can't even imagine, I don't know if you've ever thought about what it must have been like when they were sacrificing a thousand animals and splashing the blood all over you know, the altar and temple and everything. What a horrendous gore fest that might have, would feel like to us today. And so we don't have to do that anymore. Okay? Um, and again, political correctness would say, oh, we should, you know, that was wrong. But no, that's what God said to do, so it wasn't wrong. I'm glad we don't have to do it now. But it's, that was a ceremonial expectation that got fulfilled in Jesus. So the traditional approach is to separate moral, civil, and ceremonial law and to see that civil had to do with the nation of Israel back then. Ceremonial had to do with the practice of the Jewish faith uniquely. But more, and so they don't, those two don't apply to us anymore, but moral does. Right is still right, wrong is still wrong. You don't kill people, you don't lie to people, you don't commit adultery, you don't steal. So that's one way to do it, and because that's the easiest one to explain, that's what I usually will say. Terry. I'm trying to figure out where bacon fits. <laughs> bacon, that's a ceremonial. Uh, it's because that was seen, God gave an instruction that you were not to touch pork or eat it or whatever. And some people have said, well, the reason some of those ceremonial laws existed, and they were ceremonial laws, um, was because God was protecting them. They didn't know about trichinosis back then and various other things that pork, you know, problems. And so it could very well be, and some of the other ceremonial things about washing, it may have been that God was, was giving them a ceremonial reason why they needed to maintain good hygiene because that wasn't that popular back then. <laughs> you know, it wasn't natural. It wasn't something they just naturally did. We have to have the same things. You know, every time you're in a bathroom in a public place, it says, you know, wash your hands before returning to work or whatever. Well, we've got to be reminded. That may have been God's way of reminding them. You need to have good hygiene. Um, so we see those, you know, those differences. Um, there are other ways, though, to interpret what laws we should follow and not. And, but the others are a little more difficult. They require a little more work, a little more interpretation. One of them is to interpret commandments according to the narrative context. In other words, to look at any particular aspect or reference to the law, to the legal requirements, and say, given the context of the narrative here, does that apply to us? Or is that something that in the narrative was unique to the Jewish people of that time? Now again, that requires a lot more work. It's not as easy to draw that line. And yet, there is, there is validity to that. In fact, I will tell you, my sense is that all three of these that I'm going to give you, traditional narrative and covenant context approach, all three have their place, and we probably should be aware of them and be applying them, all of them, when you think about Old Testament law. You know, we still run into, uh, you, still, you will run into people who say, well, I think it's, I still think it's wrong to eat pork. Not for dietary reasons, but for religious reasons. I actually had that. I was teaching a seminar in Knoxville, Tennessee, and we had people from Christian, I, I, it was a two-day seminar I was doing for people from Christian rescue missions. Well, a couple came from uh, New Orleans. And the guy who was from there said, I don't believe in eating pork. Because you know, we had... We're in Tennessee, and so the morning snack they had was, was sausage and biscuits. And he said, can you get something other than pork? I don't believe, I, I, I believe the Bible tells us not to eat pork and that we shouldn't eat it. And I'm thinking, now he had an interpretation of the law different than ours. I don't think he was correct, by the way. But um, the, you see that some people will draw the line in different places. But we can do it according to narrative context. A third way is to interpret it according to a covenant context. Reading the Mosaic Law through the grid of the New Testament, which in effect is saying on any one of the 613 commandments, is this a part of fulfilling the old covenant requirements, or is this something that is still part of the new covenant? Jesus was very clear that we were expected to live a moral life. And so the moral commandments, Jesus made it clear that in the new covenant we still are expected to live according, according to certain standards of goodness. And so we read that from a covenant perspective, and yes, we can clearly see how the moral requirements of the law 
are still there. Whereas Jesus talked about the fact that I have fulfilled the law. And he, he the ceremonial aspects of the law, one of the ones, for instance, that he was roundly criticized for is um, allowing his disciples to pick heads of grain on the Sabbath as they walk through the field and eat them. And they said, you, you know, you're letting your disciples work on the Sabbath because that was considered work. And he says, you know, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He reinterpreted a lot of the ceremonial stuff for us. And so we read that in terms of the new, new covenant. Yes? I, I was actually thinking about the Sabbath when you did that traditional approach because the Sabbath is in the Ten Commandments. And I know it's not something that anybody would naturally say was right or wrong. Right. You know, it's not like somebody who came from outside our culture would right. say, yeah, every seven days you need to rest. No. But... But because it's in the Ten Commandments, and, and the narrative context approach, right. you might think that that's still important. That's true. Uh, and again, we, we step back and say, what's the theological principle there? Even in law, yeah. the same way we would do with other things. The theological principle is, you need to rest. Mm -hmm. That you cannot be expected to work 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. In fact, so many times the Jewish people, uh, the legalistic Approach that they've taken is the Sabbath becomes this burden, yeah. and then there and, and in fact it was meant to be a freedom. The, the the you know don't do any work on the Sabbath was a way of saying I'm giving you permission one day out of seven that you don't have to work. In fact, I insist on it. You got to take your vacation days is what God was <laughs> saying, because if you don't, you're not going to be healthy. And so one day out of seven you need to take a break. You need to take a vacation day. And spend that time, instead of working to make a living, thinking about me, you know, relating to your family, that kind of thing. Because it gets into some details about the Sabbath elsewhere. So the principle there, I think, still does apply. Mm -hmm. um, they've even determined through tests that if a machine is run seven days a week, that it will wear out many, many times faster than if they, ta if they take it offline one day a week. Mm -hmm. And the implication some people drew was that even machines are intended not to have to go all the time. So I think the principle behind that is the Sabbath is not meant to be legalistic, you know, that we're legally under the bondage of that as a ceremony, what seems like ceremonial. But in fact, underneath that, the principle is that we need a break. And God has given us permission. In fact, he's insisted on it, that we should take a break. So that is still binding, I think. And we, we don't do that enough. We make excuses. But I believe there's a truth in that. Uh, right. Marvin first, and then uh, and then uh, and we'll come back, and then Lynn, yes. They made it so legalistic, though, that he deliberately would heal people on the Sabbath in, in, in their face, you know. But right. You, you missed the meaning. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, because it wasn't intended to be uh, bondage. And and the Jewish people, in fact, um, have tried, have made it so legalistic, and then they had tried to come up with all sorts of loopholes. You know what an erud wire is? If you if, if you've watched what show was that? Uh, some some cop show. Um, a Jewish family in a, in a Jewish community, a Hasidic neighborhood. Um, the, the law technically says you're not allowed to carry your infant to another house. You're not allowed to go out, you know, to shopping. But the definition of what's a house. And so one of the things they've done is they will, they will put around, if you've got like a block, they'll put in a root wire around it and technically declare this is all our house. Which means I can carry my baby, you know, two doors down to my aunt and not violate the Sabbath. And I can go to the local market as long as it's within that root wire, which we've declared to be all part of our house, living space, and I'm not in violation. So again, they make it, make it legalistic and then they have to come up with loopholes to try to get around it. And that's the whole point is you're getting it wrong. But the, the theological principle there is God wants us to rest. We are not intended to go full tilt seven days a week. And so th to that extent, while it's not a moral requirement, it is it is still applicable to us. Lynn? I think it's also a spiritual thing. Uh, I was recommended one Sunday for being late for something. And I said, oh, I got lost in time and space. I was working in my garden. And they said, you were working. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I said, well, yeah, Sunday is my day. Sunday afternoon I spend whatever time I had in my garden, and I find it very relaxing, very soul nourishing. And that is the time when I am closest to God. That's mm -hmm. when I am allowed to set aside all my daily burdens right. and worries. Mm 
and just be there in communion with God, uh, helping God's world be brighter and cleaner. Yeah. And uh, I tried to explain that to this person who is really a, a very strong Christian. And they still would not accept what I had to say. They were still condemning well, me for, for this practice. And it comes into the question of what's working. All right. Mm -hmm. if, if you're not doing it to make, to make a living, and you're not doing it because you have to, then is it working? I mean, I, I've always said I would be much happier exercising if they called it playing out instead of working out. You know? <laughs> uh, and so sometimes it's just a definition of the words, and people should not be judgmental in that same way. Again, we are not under the law, a literal you know, controlling kind of interpretation of that, but I think the right theological interpretation of that is this is a grace. God gave, and Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is supposed to be something for our benefit, because God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what we need. And so we should, you know, I work every Sunday. <laughs> um, and yet Sunday afternoon, Carol will tell you, I call golden time, because that's like the only time in the week that I really will say, I'm going to relax, I'm going to read, I'm going to nap, I'm going to watch something I want to watch on TV, I'm going to do whatever it is. But I'm not going to let all the 50 things that I know I've got to be have done by next weekend. I'm, I'm, now, I'm not universally true to this, but for the, the biggest part of the time, golden time, is when I just stop doing all that other stuff and just let down. Um, so even though I have to work on Sunday mornings, by the time we get home on Sunday afternoon, I'm going to chill. That's golden time. Right? That's my sort of Sabbath of service. Um, so, and you, you had something else to say, Carolyn? Well, it does seem like it, it's it's one of those things that we still differ the most on. Maybe not. I mean, you don't find a whole lot of people saying, I, I won't eat pork or I won't eat shellfish or Christians, right. I mean. But, um, you know, you've got Seventh-day Adventists you who do. think that the Sabbath is very, very important. And in, when I was a child, it was much bigger deal not to shop right. on Sunday or whatever. Yeah. So, well, I, you know, I grew up in the South, and I can remember when they still had what they called blue laws. Meaning nothing was allowed to be open on Sunday. It was against the law to open a store on Sunday. And heaven forbid, the package stores had to be closed. That's where you buy alcohol, because you couldn't buy alcohol just in with the state run, the state license license. So yeah, the blue laws were very much in effect back then. And they legally enforced that you couldn't do certain things on Sunday. Well, obviously that's been lifted. We then have to make the decision, and that's why this is an interpretive task. How does that apply to us? What is the theological principle behind that law? How do we apply it in a way that God intends and, and is honoring? And Jesus helps us with that by all that he said and did with really to uh, Sabbath. But it's not just, you can't do anything. And it's not just, you can do everything. There's somewhere, and that's why this is an interpretive task for us. And isn't that what God wants for the law anyway? Is for yeah. us to think about it and do it for, you know... For the right reasons. Good reasons. Yeah. Well, it, it, and because we have the, you know, we're in the context of the grace that Jesus offers. Right. Yes. Now, for the Old Testament people, the Jewish people, when the law was given, it was given because they had demonstrated very clearly that they couldn't, they were not making good decisions about stuff. And that's why for the Hebrew people at that time, it was ironclad. You know, whether you understand it or not, whether you like it or not, you don't eat pork. But I really like bacon. I don't care. <laughs> well, that's not true for us anymore. We, we have the responsibility in the light of, in, in the, the shadow of the mercy of Christ and the grace of Christ, we have to interpret these things in light of grace. And so we have a very different approach than they do. Doesn't mean they're not valid anymore. There is still something there. The Sabbath example being one. Doesn't mean that, oh, well, you know, I can do whatever, or Sabbath doesn't matter anymore. But it doesn't mean that I'm under that kind of bondage. Pardon? Well, we get in trouble when we're trying to interpret the laws for other people who are unbelievers. You know, I, I don't exactly. believe I should eat pork, and you shouldn't eat pork either. Exactly. I'm going to ban pork. You know, so yeah. then you have a lot of yeah. bad interactions. Like my reaction to the guy in Knoxville was, but it's country sausage and biscuits. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know? Okay, let's take a break. We'll come back at 20 after. All right, let's pick back up. You're right, I should look this way. The next genre that's primarily in the Old Testament we're going to talk about is the genre of Proverbs. Proverbs are a subset of wisdom literature, and I can talk about wisdom literature. Um, wisdom literature are 
wise sayings. In the Old Testament, wisdom literature includes uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, Song of Songs. All of those have to do with moral truths about living a good life. The wisdom literature is less about faith than it is about life. Well, Proverbs is, a, and, and most of that is pretty straightforward, but Proverbs are a subset of wisdom literature, and it's a broad genre in which reflections and sayings of the wise are recorded in the proverbial sense, in Proverbs, usually as aphorisms or as sayings that you can, you can remember. Now, Proverbs exist in almost all kinds of literature. Uh, virtually every language has a genre of Proverbs. Biblical Proverbs differ from other kinds of Proverbs in that they are divinely inspired, and so while they may have to do with human life, you know, seek, get, get wisdom, get knowledge, for instance, as a proverb, um, they're reflecting what God approves of or condemns. So even they, though it is these proverbs, biblical proverbs, are addressing what may seem like a very practical kind of this is what you ought to do or what you ought not to do, stay away from loose women, for instance, there's a lot of that in the book of Proverbs. Um, in this case, they are what God, it's God saying this. And so we take them very seriously. They take on a very different level of meaning and importance for us because these are things that God is instructing us on, not just, you know, so God doesn't say stay away from loose women because you could get venereal disease. That's not the point. You know, there's a, there's a larger sort of divinely oriented moral issue there. Um, and so these differ in that regard. But even biblical proverbs, except those that refer to God's nature. Now, some proverbs have to do with, with statements about God. Other than the ones that are statements about God, biblical proverbs are circumstantial. What that means is they allow for and even generally assume the possibility of exceptions. And what that means is you'll get different proverbs that seem like they're contradicting each other. They're in one place, a proverb says, um, you know, do not respond to a fool the way the fool thinks. And another, because if so, you might become a fool. In another place it says, when you respond to a fool, respond to the fool the way the fool thinks, because that's the only way you're going to get through to him. And it sounds like they're absolutely contradictory. Well, it's because it's circumstantial. You know, that's, we're called upon to have wisdom to know at which time do we need to use the same sort of language feeding back to somebody who's being foolish, versus when do we need to completely say, you're out to lunch, you know, later, dude. Um, so there is an aspect to which many of the biblical proverbs, except the ones that are proverbial statements about God's nature, they are circumstantial. We have to read them uh, as helpful guidance, but not as absolute requirements, statements, or promises. For instance, in the book of Proverbs, it says that if, very simply, that if you are diligent in your work, you will become wealthy. It says that. If you want to be wealthy, be diligent in your work. Well, not everybody who's diligent in their work becomes wealthy. You can't read that as an absolute. But there's no other way to get there, unless you inherit it. Um, and so that's, that's a minimum requirement. But you can't read that as an absolute guarantee. Wait a minute, God, I've worked really, really hard, and I'm not wealthy yet. You broke your promise to me. No, you can't read it that way. Does that make sense? So we have to use the... The, the main thing in interpreting Proverbs, we have to use common sense. You know, and you have to, if you, if you read that, then you say, well, not everybody who's worked hard has become wealthy. That can't be what that means. And yet, turn it around, there is no other way to become wealthy. And then there's, then there, other than working you know, hard, diligently. It says a little slumber, a little sleep, a little you know, crossing of the hands to rest, and you know, nothing. You're not going to get anywhere. On the other hand, but to understand that that's the only way to get there doesn't mean that God is promising that, right? And you have to use some wisdom. You have to use some common sense when you interpret those things. That is a fundamental reality about interpreting proverbial statements, the proverbs. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? It's brilliant stuff. I mean, you know, the one of the one of the wisdom books, uh, Ecclesiastes, you know, which is the, as far as I know, is the only section of the Bible that has ever inspired a top ten rock and roll hit. You know, turn, 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 the birds. Um, you know, you read Ecclesiastes, 
And if you read it literally and you say this guy is speaking for God, I mean, at a certain point, he just despairs. Nothing's worth anything. You know, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And, you, you know, you don't read that with some common sense, with some wisdom in the whole context of God's message to us. And, you know, you blow your brains out. So that does require some wisdom in reading the wisdom literature, and especially the Proverbs. Okay. Um, let's talk about the next genre of the Old Testament, which is poetry. Poetry occurs within many other biblical genres. Even You could even say, for instance, in Paul's writings, in the epistles, from time to time, Paul will have a doxology or some other sort of um, statement of benediction, or, and, he, and it's written as a poem. So there are poetic forms in almost every other genre. But they predominate in two books especially, which are the Book of Psalms and the, book, the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, as it's sometimes called. Um, Psalms is poetry because it's song lyrics, and a song lyric is a poem. So you get the book of Psalms, and then the song of songs is a love poem uh, between a man and a woman. Again, often allegorically interpreted, but it is poetry. Now, when we talk about poetry, Hebrew poetry is very different than Western poetry, and you have to understand that. Hebrew po poetry has very little in it that resembles Western poetry than what we think of. Especially, Hebrew poetry does not have rhyme or recognizable meter. I mean, even in the Hebrew, while they may use word sounds sometimes uh, to, in Hebrew, obviously when you translate that into something else, unless you're reading it in the Hebrew, you're not going to get any sense of rhyme or of rhythm, which is meter is the rhythm. Um, you get no examples like uh, Poe. And each silken sat on certain rustling of each purple curtain, this kind of thing, where you've got a, a clear meter, there's a beat, you bounce through this, and you don't get the same. They do have some, um, you know, some sound references, but you don't get that when it's translated into English, so don't look for it, unless you're fluent enough in Hebrew to be able to read Hebrew poetry well. Instead, I would describe those as being, um, Western examples, as being poetry of sound. We listen for the beat. We listen for the, the rhyme of words or for the various other figures of speech. You know, if there's alliteration or uh, onomatopoeia or various other kinds of things, we pick those up by hearing them. Well, we don't hear that in Hebrew. In fact, even written in Hebrew, there's very little of that sort of thing that exists in Hebrew poetry. It does repeat syllables sometimes. It sometimes will repeat lines or sounds or stress patterns. But uh, that doesn't translate, and none of it is to the extent that we hear it in Western poetry. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. Da 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 da. In fact, bad poetry usually is poetry that falls into that so much that it becomes, you know, redundant. Um, it's better to understand Hebrew poetry as what you could call poetry of the mind, because it deals not in sounds, but in imagery and in ideas, and the interplay of imagery, and the interplay of ideas. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about several different kinds in, in a moment, but you can't read Hebrew poetry expecting it to be what you're used to, even whether in English translation or in the original. Now, the reason for poetry is that poetry is intended to make words more memorable, or to express or evoke strong emotions. Poetry like, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by a river of water. You see the imagery in that? That brings forth his fruit in his season. Hebrew, and that's poetry. In fact, if, you, if you're wondering whether a certain passage of scripture is, is poetry or not, is it written? in short lines, you know, that are indented. In other words, is it written the way a poem looks like it's written? Almost always in modern Western translations, if it is Hebrew poetry, or, or Greek poetry even, in the case of like doxologies and things, they usually will set it off with, with a different form. It's not just line after line. And that will tell you very visually whether or not that's a poetic form. But the memory uh, part of that, it evokes strong emotions, um, expresses strong emotions, and we should expect when we read poetry to get figurative, exa exaggerated language that cannot be taken literally. 
Um, sometimes, it, it, instead of, he shall be like a tree, like a tree, which is a simile, you'll read places where it will say, you know, he's a tree. <laughs> well, not really. Now, that's a metaphor. And so we need to understand that and expect that when we read poetry. This is all part of the interpretive process. Um, the, the question that we have to ask when we read Hebrew poetry is, what did the inspired author intend to communicate? Because again, this is in scripture for a reason. There is meaning behind it. It's not just, you know, Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, the, the Raven. You could draw some meaning behind it in terms of the, you know, the hopelessness of human love or whatever you wanted to do, but mostly it is written for the beauty of the language. The raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight over him streaming casts his shadow on the floor. You know, you read that stuff, and it is for the beauty of the language, for the, 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 the singing of the language. Well, Hebrew poetry, you're not going to get that kind of thing. And so you need to say, what is it the Hebrew poet is trying to communicate? It's not just the beauty of the language. Again, I'm there are a few places in Hebrew poetry, but you really have to be pretty fluent in Hebrew to get that. But it's there for a reason. And what is that? That's the interpretive key to being able to read Hebrew poetry and understand it. Um, and then, it's important to recognize that there are certain kinds of Hebrew poetic forms. You don't have to have these memorized, but when you come across them, you need to recognize them because that will help you to interpret. There is a lot of different kinds of parallelism. There is synonymous parallelism. Parallel, synonymous parallelism words, there are two lines that restate the same thing in different words. All right? Um, and I should have examples for you here, and I don't. There's antithetical parallelism, in which the first line states something, and the second line seems to be saying something the opposite, an antithesis. And then the rest of the poetic form is, is explaining that. Um, and then there's synthetic parallelism, which the first line makes a statement and the second line adds to it, you know, expands on it. It's not the same thing, but it's some further. So when you read, and you, and you can pick this up in English is the point. You don't have to read Hebrew to get this. A statement that is reinforced by a second statement that is the, that is the same point, that's the, the um, synonymous par parallelism, antithetical is a statement and then what sounds like an opposite and then they explain why both those are true or makes a statement and then there's an addition to it. It expands on it. You also get the X and X plus one. That will say things like, there are three things God hates, four that he cannot stand. And you read that and go, wait a minute, did he just remember one right in the middle of writing this? <laughs> no, that's, that's a, type, a, a form that they use in Hebrew poetry for emphasis. There, there are six virtues a man must, must seek, uh, seven, that he should follow, kind of thing. That's x, x plus 1. You also get repetition of words or sounds. Again, that they'll if verily, verily. That's an example where, for emphasis, they'll repeat the same word more than once. Yes, Lynn? The x plus 1, is it the plus 1 that the emphasis is on? No, it's actually, it's, it, it, they're emphasizing the whole thing, but they're doing it by sort of going part way and then punching you with the rest of it. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, it's, the plus one isn't necessarily more important than the first part of it. Like if it's, there are six virtues a man should pursue seven that God desires of him kind of thing. Right. It's not to say that the seventh one is the one that's important. They're just emphasizing all of them by using that kind of structure. Right. Um, uh, acrostics, which is where you, you literally have, you know, an acrostic is um, where you have a word, each letter represents something. The example of that is Psalm 119 the longest of all the Psalms, uh, every section of Psalm 119 starts with a Hebrew letter. And in the Hebrew, it, it literally starts with that letter. And so that becomes a, a poetic form, a structure that is followed, sort of a, a mechanical form. Uh, there are other places where there will be a poem and each line will begin with a different, different Hebrew letter or a different number which represents a different Hebrew letter because there's the gematria is every letter in the Hebrew language has a number equivalent. And it's not just one through 26 kind of thing. But so you get acrostics where they have used a structure. It's, if you ever had an English class, if you ever had discussions about, about poetry and they'll go A-A-B-B-A-B -B -B as a structure form, okay? 
it's the same thing, except they will actually use words that start with certain letters. And it may be A, B, C, D, E, and each line starts with a different letter, except in Hebrew. Uh, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Halit, uh, but the... M is for the many things she gave me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so you'll pick that up. And then there's chiasm, which I think we've talked about before. Chiasm is where there is a series of lines that build out, you know, like it could be it's as few as two or three, where it makes a statement and then it expands that, it expands that, and expands that, and then the next line does the same thing. It's like it's like stepping backwards through the same pieces. So chiasm means it goes out, boom, 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 and then the next lines come back and basically make the same points again, perhaps in slightly different words, but boom, 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 boom. There are the whole book of Daniel is a chiasm because uh, part of the book of Daniel is written in Hebrew, part of the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic. It's the, the most Aramaic we have. And those two halves, the Hebrew and the Aramaic, they, they build the story out. And there are examples of visions, for instance, that, that Daniel has going out. And then when it comes back in the same, the same place in the structure, only reversed, you'll have a similar vision. And so the book of Daniel, the whole book, is a chiasm form that goes out, and then comes back, and each section in parallel will not literally repeat it, but will clearly be uh, another example of the same thing, right? So you get a lot of that kind of stuff, and most people are completely clueless about that because they're reading it in English. You don't you don't structure it, but if you've got a good study Bible, it will tell you, like the Book of Daniel, it will tell you this is a chiasm. Uh, it goes out. And then it comes back, making the same points as it withdraws that it did when it was going out. So all these are poetic forms. The more you learn about that, the more you will be able to understand what the original writer's intention was. Because different forms, you know, for instance, if, if the form is x, x plus 1, then the points there are the emphasis. If the, the use is, um, if he's using a reiteration of sounds or words, then those words that are being reiterated are the point, and that tells you what to focus on. So the more you learn about Hebrew poetry, and the more you're able to recognize it in its English form, the more clearly you'll be able to interpret what the author was intending for you, and that, that is the issue, is, it, is the interpretation of what the original author intended. Okay, questions about that? Then we have psalms, which are part of poetry, as I said earlier, but they're unique in that they are songs. Um, the book of psalms, and don't ever say, you know, it was Psalms 19. It's psalm, singular, not, not the S on the end, 19. Psalms is the whole book. So the book of psalms was the worship song book of the Hebrew people. It's part of the larger poetic genre, but it deserves its own attention because the book of psalms is unique in a lot of different ways. Um, the best way to understand the Book of Psalms is to understand that there are subgenres within the Book of Psalms. And each of those that you read, and they're, they're pretty obvious, but when you read them, you'll understand more clearly what the author's intent was and how it applies to us by recognizing it as being of a certain type. The seven major subgenres within Psalms are Psalms of Lament. This is by far the, more, the, the most common one. Psalms of Lament. Um, are songs of mourning and distress either directed to God or about God abandoning us or whatever it is. Okay? Uh, and God didn't really, but it felt like it. So these expressions of grief is what a song of lament is. Because of destruction, because of failure, David has a lot of these. You know, Absalom, my Absalom, you know, why are you against me, my son? You know? um, so song, songs of lament. And once you recognize that, then you can talk about what is the grief over and why is it. Then praise psalms that praise God as creator, savior of Israel, or sovereign over history. Again, a lot of the Davidic psalms are praise psalms. Um, Thanksgiving psalms that thank God for answering petitions. When God answers a prayer the way you want it, there are psalms of thanksgiving. There are celebration psalms that celebrate God's covenant relationship with his people. He is our God, we are his people, kind of psalms. There are wisdom psalms, 
which are a hybrid of song and wisdom literature that deal with the source of true wisdom, dealing with injustice, etc. So they have to do with how you live your life kinds of stuff, like the wisdom literature, but they do so in a song form in the book of Psalms. There are penitential psalms, which confess sin and declare repentance. Um, again, David, after the Bathsheba event, there, uh, David expressed that in the psalms especially, about his own sinfulness and his desire, don't hold this against me, God, I am so sorry. And then you get imprecatory psalms, which is calling on God to enact justice against the psalmist's enemy. These are their dash the baby's heads against the rock psalms, which people have so much trouble with. Um, they're in there. Oops. Um, you know, destroy the enemies, God, by, your, by the might of your right hand. Wipe them out, kinds of stuff. So once you understand and can recognize that there are different subgenres of psalms, it will be easier to understand where was the writer coming from, and so there, how do I interpret it? All right? We then have, um, well, this guide to interpreting the psalms. You need to note the organization of the book of Psalms. The longest book in the Bible is 150 Psalms. The Apocrypha has 151st Psalm, but we don't count that. So 150 Psalms, and they're divided, most people don't realize, into five different books. This, it's believed that this may have been done originally in imitation of the book of, of the Pentateuch. The five books, the first one is from Psalm 1 to 41, the second from Psalm 42 to 72, the third from Psalm 73 to 89, fourth from Psalm 90 to 106, and the fifth from Psalm 107 to 150. Now, the, a primary reason for these breaks is the authorship. You know, like, like a couple of these are predominantly the Psalms of David, and are sort of gathered together in one place. But they do sit, take on some thematic differences too. I'm not gonna get into the details of that. But knowing that there is an intentional particular kind of structure in terms of a five-fold uh, partition in the Psalms is helpful. We need, when we're doing interpretation, to focus on reading the Psalms themselves rather than the mountain of commentary. There is no book of the Bible that has had more written about it interpretively, you know, poetically, than the book of Psalms. And that's great, but don't start there. If you're taking this as a, not as a, just a devotional exercise, but rather as a, an interpretive exercise, you need to deal with the text. You need to apply certain interpretive principles, you know, like what kind of Psalm is this, um, who wrote it, what was the context, and all those kinds of things we've talked about all along, but don't start with somebody's beautiful you know, writing about the glory of uh, uh, the 23rd Psalm. If you actually, some of these that you might know well, when you sit down and you actually read it and pay attention to what the words say, you may have a completely different understanding than what you've grown up with. Right? Um, you need to identify the subgenre sub of the psalm, which is the best way to understand the author's intention, because that's what these do, is they define it according to what's the purpose here. Is it a lament? Is it a, you know, a thanksgiving? Is it an imprecatory psalm, etc.? Look at the other psalms in that same uh, subgenre. This thing doesn't always work. Which gives you an understanding of what that whole subgenre looks like and feels like and helps you in the terms of interpreting any given psalm that's in that subgenre. Then you need to note any superscriptions and other contextual information. The superscriptions are the little comments that are made above each psalm. A psalm of David. You know who it is. Um, a psalm of David. And to be sung with a choir, All right? Well, you know it's a worship song that was intended to be used in worship. There are little notes at the start of every song, almost every song, that tell you something about who wrote it, what it was to be used for, maybe even what the situation was, because sometimes they have little situational comments. Um, so pay attention to that and any other contextual information that you may pick up as you go along. Pay attention to how the psalm is structured and how it's segmented, because again, if it's chiasmic, psalms can be chiasmic as well where they go out and then come back, well, that will tell you something about how the events were occurring, perhaps, in, in this, because some of the Psalms are David's, for instance, David's account of events that happened to him, like you know, Bathsheba or with Absalom, etc. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to those. And then in terms of interpreting the Psalms, recognize the poetic language and symbolism used in the Psalm, Explore any messianic significance that's reflected in the psalm because a lot of the psalms have very clear references to the hope and expectation for one who is to come. You know, David, for instance, at one point writes, um, the Lord said to my Lord. Well, later on, 
Paul uses that. It says, what do you think he was talking about? Except for the fact that there was one to come later than David that was not God, but still would be David's Lord, a descendant of David who was the Messiah. So Paul interprets that clearly as being, Paul, David's talking about Jesus speaking to God the Father. You know, the Lord said to my Lord. Um, it's also helpful, and this is devotional, but it's also helpful in terms of understanding them, to pray the Psalms. This is a discipline that so many Christians have lost, which used to be very common, to actually read the Psalms slowly, meditatively, as you speaking to God, to use them as a prayer. And to, as you do so, think about them, let them soak in, think about what they mean, and really use these as the words you're speaking to God. All right? And you will find meaning there that you did not find before. Um, then memorize the Psalms. Memorization, those of you who are in our communications and homiletic, homiletics class, we've talked a lot about memorizing, about the importance of that, and uh, the idea of memorizing the Psalms. Start with 23, if you don't know it already, memorize Psalm 1, work your way up to Psalm 119, <laughs> the longest book of the uh, chapter of the Bible. So, but the point is that so many of these are such beautiful, beautiful expressions of God and our relationship to Him. If you memorize them, then you have that beauty with you all the time. Driving in your car or whatever. This is one of the great tragedies of us not, not memorizing things anymore, is that if, if we're in a situation that we can't have it right in front of us, then we don't have it. You memorize it, and you take it with you everywhere. Even if your hands are busy and your eyes are busy, you could be thinking it, or you can be saying it out loud to yourself. So memorizing is, is it's, it's terrible that we have lost that as a discipline, and as a skill. And you can learn it. People say, oh, I just can't memorize anything. Yes, you can, unless you just decide that you're too lazy to. It may not be easy. It's easier for some people than others. But everybody can memorize, all right? And we need to do it more. And then you might also try singing the psalms. A lot of the psalms, we don't have any of the original music. But a lot of the psalms, because they originally were songs, and especially worship songs, a lot of them have been set to music in modern times. And so you can learn some of the, to sing some of the psalms based upon more modern music. Um, and it's a great way to memorize them. It's easier to memorize them. Now, how many of you may think you can't memorize, but how many song lyrics do you know? 10,000. You can bet on it, all right? Uh, the whole, it's so popular, we actually have named that tune. You know, we get just the notes. We memorize the notes as well as the words. And so, yeah, it's, that's one way is sing the songs. And you can find it, in, you can go online and look up um, music to the songs and find all kinds of things. Any questions about any of that? Or any of the things we've talked about today? Old Testament interpretation? You understand why in some ways it's more difficult? And also, while more challenging, it can be very exciting when you start looking at Hebrew poetry and things like that as well. Okay, are we good? I'm done. You get seven minutes off.